Good morning, friends. Welcome to Moreland Presbyterian Church in Portland, Oregon. I'm Brian Marsh, the pastor here, and we're so glad that you have joined us for our weekly experience of worship and uh, thankful to be able to continue connecting in this way, week in and week out. Um, and uh, it's good to be with you all, and uh, it's good to be in a space where uh, in the midst of so many changes and so much uncertainty and so much unpredictability in life that uh, we still have a time like this to be able to count on and to know that we can connect uh, at least through the means available uh, to be reminded that we're connected in spirit and in friendship as a community and love. Um, we're really glad that you've uh, chosen to join us uh, for this time this morning or whenever you may be uh, joining us later in the day or this week. Um, we are a gathering of ordinary imperfect people. We're an ordinary imperfect church. But we are gathered together because we're connected by an extraordinary and perfect love. And our hope, our desire is to not just experience that within ourselves or share it with each other, but much more to share it with our neighborhood and our city and our world. And so our hope this week and every week is that whenever we gather together, uh, each of us would feel welcome and accepted and free to enter into the space in the ways that are most natural and meaningful for you. So uh, thanks again for joining us this morning. It's good to be with you. And now let's enter into our time of worship together through our call to worship. <clears throat> Recognizing the power in which we live and breathe like water for sea creatures and air for birds. Realizing the privilege which opens so much more possibility and opportunity for us than others. We gather in the presence of the one who realized all rights to power and privilege and came to us as one of us, embodying divine weakness and foolishness greater than mortal power and wisdom, and the humbleness not to be served by others, but to serve others in lim limitless love. And we praise that love and pray that our love of power would be overruled by the power of love. Amen. Our hymn of praise is the church of Christ in every age. Let's lift our voices wherever we are together in praise. The church of Christ in every age beset by change but be must claim and test its heritage and keep on rising from the dead across the world across the street the victims of injustice cry for shelter and for bread to eat and never live before they die. Then let the servant church arise, a caring church that longs to partner in Christ's sacrifice and clothed in Christ's humanity. For Christ alone, whose blood was shed, can cure the fever 
in our blood and teach us how to share our bread and feed the starving multitude. We have no mission but to serve and fall obedient to our Lord, to care for all without reserve, and spread Christ's liberating word. Indeed, we are part of a community that is so much broader and wider and diverse than our own. And when we gather together in times like these, we're reminded that we are merely one part of a much greater whole, that we truly are one body that not only spans geography, but spans generation. And that in that one body, we celebrate the one love that connects us, the one spirit that gives us life, the one hope that continues to empower and motivate us forward. We also recognize the ways that that body is hurting, the way that that body is wounded the ways that we have wounded each other and wounded ourselves, the ways that we ourselves have been wounded. So when we come to a time of reflection, we bring all of that into this safe and sacred space. And we also have an opportunity in that silence to release all that binds us, all that causes us anxiety and worry. All, of a, all that weighs us down in guilt and shame. And so let's enter into this safe and sp sacred space of reflection and release, first in silence. Let's join together in prayer. In the name of the one who knows us fully and loves us freely. Amen. Amen. As we lament the current brokenness and inequality of our world, our community and our lives, we are embraced by the one who turns our mourning into dancing and our lamenting into laughing. In Jesus the Christ, we are accepted, we are forgiven, we are loved. Thanks be to God. Amen. And now, friends, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ with those with whom you are sheltering in the comments section on Facebook Live, through phone call, text message, shout out to neighbor, any ways that are possible. Know that you are loved and you are love. Peace be with you. Good morning. For our time with children today, 
I want to lift up those who are caring for and raising children. I think the coming of fall has particular significance for these people. I know for me, fall has always meant a welcome return back to a predictable schedule, a predictable routine. But this fall is different. A week ago Friday would have been the first meeting of the year for our Moreland Mothers of Preschoolers group. The fellowship hall would have been filled with mothers, the classrooms with young children. In talking with the women who lead the group about ways we can reimagine the connection and the fellowship for this year, a word kept cropping up, overwhelmed. These mothers are feeling overwhelmed with online school, homeschool, crazy hybrid school, uh, overwhelmed with the constant togetherness, and at the same time overwhelmed by absence. The absence of grandparents and other family members, the absence of play dates and sleepovers, the absence of babysitters, the absence of respite. But through all that, the bright spirits of these women shine through. So for all those caring for and raising children, I offer these words of encouragement. I first saw them posted by an overwhelmed mom on social media. They are written by Rachel Marie Martin, who is a mother and an author of a blog called Finding Joy. Don't give up on this year. Keep fighting for the good. Keep showing up. Keep loving. Keep being kind. Keep being brave. Keep caring. Keep trying new things. Keep showing grace. Keep on. This world needs you to believe in the good. Amen. Good morning, everybody. The first reading this morning is from Matthew 23, 1 through 12. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples. The legal experts and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, you must take care to do everything they say, but don't do what they do. For they tie together heavy packs that are impossible to carry. They put them on the shoulders of others, but are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do, they do to be noticed by others. They make extra wide prayer bands for their arms and long tassels for their clothes. They love to sit in places of honor at banquets and in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with honor in... <laughs> Hang on just a second. They love to be greeted in honor in the markets and to be addressed as rabbi. But you shouldn't be called rabbi because you have one teacher and all of you are brothers and sisters. Don't call anybody on earth your father because you have one creator who is heavenly. Don't be called teacher because Christ is your one teacher. But the one who is greatest among you will be your servant. All who lift themselves up will be brought low but all who make themselves low will be lifted up. And the next reading is 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 31. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? In divine wisdom, God determined that the world wouldn't come to know God through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. 
Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Look at your situation when you were called, sisters and brothers. By ordinary human standards, not many were wise, not many were powerful, not many were from the upper class. But God chose what the world considers foolish to shame the wise. God chose what the world considers weak to shame the strong. And God chose what the world considers low class and low life, what is considered to be nothing, to reduce what is considered to be something. So no human being can brag in God's presence. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from, from God for us. This means that Christ Jesus made us righteous and holy and delivered us. This is consistent with what was written. The one who boasts should boast in the Lord. The one who boasts should boast in the Lord. Thanks, Jeannie, and thanks, Sarah. Let's pause for a few moments to breathe and to pray. Gracious God, we are thankful for your ever presence with us in the midst of these days where we do feel stuck, where we are feeling overwhelmed. And yet the connections continue. We are thankful for the power of your love, the presence of your spirit. And we ask now that as we consider these words from the pages of scripture, that by your spirit, they might speak into the pages of our lives in ways that we can hear and know and understand. And so may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and dreams and meditations of our hearts be a delight to you. For God, you are our delight. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Phenomenal cosmic powers. Itty bitty living space. Name that film. For any of you who've had children in the past 30 years, it should come instantly to mind. The film being Aladdin. I was reminded of Aladdin this past week watching a documentary about the remarkable Robin Williams, who did such an amazing uh, turn as the genie in Aladdin and remembering that opening scene where the genie is introducing himself to Aladdin, describing his ability to grant him three wishes with limitations, describing his cosmic powers and tiny living space, and also the shackles on his wrists that kept him bound and not free. And that he could only be set free by a master who freely chose to do so. Well, in fairy tales, as well as in real life, power comes within parameters. And yet, us humans throughout our history have sought power beyond parameters, time and time again. And I wonder if that's partly because power within parameters appears to be too limited or stifling or even foolish. Jesus was addressing a mixed crowd. Some were looky-loos, curious. Others were people who were following him from town to town. Some were religious leaders and Jesus has some words regarding those religious leaders how they weighed other people down with 
unnecessary burdens of tradition and law while not helping to bear those burdens themselves. How they would wear their garments and titles and positions in society like peacocks strutting, strutting their feathers. How they oozed a kind of power over others and relished in that power. And Jesus replying by saying, you may need to do what they say, but do not do what they do. Because there is no one who is greater than anyone else in the human family. You are in this together. All who exalt themselves will be humbled. All who humble themselves will be exalted. And Paul echoes the spirit of these words from Jesus in his words to that emerging faith community in Corinth, made up of people largely seeking greater wisdom and greater power. He says that some of us look for signs and wonders, others of us look to philosophy or science for answers. But the crux of reality, not just religion, but the crux of reality is a cross. The core exposition and exegesis of human existence is an execution. The core of our being is a love that reveals its unconquerable strength in weakness through embracing and conquering death. It reveals its indefinable wisdom through a foolishness the foolishness of an incarcerated liberator, a sacrificed savior, a wounded healer, the one who emerged from the box of a tomb, a grave, and who invites all God's children then and now to lay down our boxes of thought and tradition, of perception and perspective and philosophy, and to open ourselves to a much deeper and broader and greater reality. It all sounds so beautiful on paper, does it not? The ideal is compelling. And yet there's this tension that always seems to arise between the ideal of living this divine foolishness and weakness and the reality of actually doing it. Humbleness and mutuality and solidarity. And I always wonder why that is. And then I wonder if maybe it's because we are people of privilege. We have ready access to affluence and autonomy and safety and ultimately power. And this seems to kind of fly in the face with the heritage of the Christian tradition of which many of us are a part. A tradition that is founded in experiences like exodus and exile, crucifixion and resurrection, persecution and persistence. The historian Harvey Cox reminds us that the earliest experiences and expressions of the Christian tradition were of a lived embodied faith. Faith not as a noun, but as a verb. Faith as a way of being and living. And that this was the primary expression for the first three centuries or so of the Christian tradition, an era that he calls the age of faith. Until that tradition was co-opted by the Roman Empire in the fourth century. And a shift occurred where that faith in Christ as a way of living became belief in theology as a way of belonging. What Cox has termed the age of belief. And the interesting and unfortunate irony that arose from that shift 
were those who were persecuted for living out their faith in Christ became the persecutors of those who didn't subscribe to the approved and accepted set of beliefs about that faith. We've seen from that time forward that when the Christian tradition is ensconced with empire, it is nearly impossible to identify with experiences like the exodus or the exile because we in those situations find ourselves as the ones in power. And so if we're honest about it, we identify more with the Egyptians and the Babylonians in those stories than the Israelites. We've seen time and time again that when Christianity connects with empire, it never ends well for Christianity or for the empire. And so I wonder what drives us to continually fall into this pattern. And my sense is that at the heart of that drive is fear. Fear of losing power once it's gained. A fear which drives us in the first place to seek power from outside of ourselves, beyond ourselves which then draws out and depletes power, depletes power from others that we then use for our own purposes and agendas, our hopes and dreams and desires. But there is a love that we are made of, a love that exists beneath that fear a love that recognizes the presence of a power within ourselves, a power that flows naturally out from our authentic selves to others for their benefit rather than for our own, a power that helps to awaken those others to their own power within, which then flows out to others and builds an increasing collective sense of power, which can be harnessed for the benefit and flourishing of all creatures, all creation in one blessed and beloved community. History has shown us that anytime there is transformative positive change that comes into a society, it does not come from those in positions of political power, but rather from a person or a small group of people who recognize that power within, which then awakens them to the experiences of oppression and justice around them and empowers them to respond in faith by living out of that inner power. It flows from them in ways that awaken others to their power, which eventually sparks a movement of love and spirit that lifts up the oppressed and raises the voices of those silenced in cries for justice and equality. The cries which are eventually heard by those in positions of power to respond, whether out of political expediency or more altruistic motives, to respond and enact steps towards greater justice and equality. Whether it was the abolition movement in the 19th century, the civil rights movement in the 20th century, or the racial equality and climate justice movements of the 21st century, it's the same power, the power of love coming from within and flowing out. And I see this power emerging and flowing in another surprising way that can feel threatening to those of us who are part of the traditional Christian tradition to see an increasing number 
of people from emerging generations who are not investing in maintaining traditional religious structures and communities, but who are engaging with the spirit in deep and profound ways and embodying faith in real and transformative ways outside of the religious boxes that we've erected over the generations. Those who identify as spiritual, not religious, may appear to be foolish or even weak to those of us who are connected to privilege and power. But I sense that they actually embody that deeper and greater wisdom and power that Jesus embodied in his life and that Jesus even referred to at his time of ascension, when his first followers came to him and said, now is it time? Is it finally our time to reach out and grab that power ourselves? That power that we've been longing for, for so long, those keys to the kingdoms of this world, and Jesus sighs and smiles and says, the power that is being unleashed, the power that is within you and will flow through you is a power of a different kind altogether. Cox has labeled the era in which we are living the past 40 or 50 years as the age of spirit, where those boxes that we've erected around our traditions to protect and preserve them are gradually eroding. And that this is actually less of a crisis and more a gift of opportunity. And I think of poor old Jafar the nemesis of Aladdin, who is trapped by his own desire for acquiring that power outside of himself, and who eventually gains possession of the genie and begins asking the genie to grant him wishes. But then Aladdin fools him with some divine foolishness of his own by reminding him that he is still dependent on the power of the genie and that he is not the most powerful of all, which leads Jafar to ask for his third wish to become the greatest genie of all and enjoys a few glorious moments of phenomenal cosmic power until he is reminded of that itty bitty living space and those chains of servitude clasp upon his wrists and he recognizes that he is trapped in that desire for power outside of himself. And then Aladdin remembers that he has one more wish and he knows what that wish is. And he is able to set the genie free because he recognizes that he has that power within himself to be the person he was created to be, to live the life he was created to live, and that he doesn't need to use the genie as his source of power. He's able to set the genie free because he himself is free. And so I wonder, in our world of divisiveness and despair, polarities and polarization and paralyzation because of fear, how might we one day come to know more deeply and fully that inner power of love, that gift from God, and to know true and lasting peace? And then I'm reminded of the words of Mahatma Gandhi. 
that the world will know peace the day that our love of power is overruled by the power of love. And so friends, how might that strength of divine weakness, that wisdom of divine foolishness, reveal to us in deeper, more transformative ways the power of love within us that is more primal than our love of power? How might that power of love enlighten us to those forces of fear that trap us in longing for that power beyond ourselves? And how might that power of love release us to realize that we are already free and that we might even be catalysts to set each other free? Amen. Let's join together in prayer for our world and our community. In a world where so many things separate us, God, we ask that you bring us together. In a world that confuses unity with sameness, God, we ask that you show us how to know and love those things that make us different. As we in the United States find ourselves at a heart of social, cultural, and religious ten tensions that run deep, as we find ourselves soaking in the belonging that we feel with those we deem as our own, as we find ourselves often deeply, viscerally, painfully afraid of the volatility that has permeated our relationships with each other. God, we ask that you remind us that we are all made in your image. Poor and well off, we are made in your image. Black, brown, and white, we are made in your image. Queer, trans, and straight, we are made in your image. Native American and immigrant, we are made in your image. From Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, the Arctic, South America, North America, we are made in your image. Housed and houseless, we are made in your image. People of all abilities, we are made in your image and your spirit reminds us that we belong together. With all of our differences, we belong together. God, we ask that you grant us the strength, the serenity, the courage, the wisdom to embark upon the work of healing the chasms between us. We ask that you send us the fruits of your spirit in our interactions. Send us your love, send us your joy, send us your peace, send us your patience, send us your kindness, send us your goodness, send us your faithfulness, send us your gentleness and send us your self-control. Let these be the things that bind us together. Let these be the spaces and the places where we find our belonging, not in the opposition of another's ideals, not in the pack mentality of those who are like us, not in the acceptance of those we admire, but in our deep commitment to love, to experience joy, to feel at peace, to have your patience, to show your kindness, to embody your goodness, to trust in your faithfulness, to exhibit your gentleness and to practice responsible self-control. Let this be where we find our belonging, O oh God. Let this be how we embody you in the world. Amen. And uh, now, we get to, I get to announce several amazing things that we have going on um, through Moreland this coming week. First um, is the book group, which will follow worship. It's the last section of the myth of the American dream at 11 right here on Zoom. Um, the create women's group, which will happen Monday at seven on Zoom. And the Wednesday morning scripture conversation for all people of all genders uh, at 8 a.m. on Zoom. 
Um, next Sunday, which is October 4th, is a big Sunday. We have several things happening. It's World Communion Sunday. Um, and it is also um, when we will be collecting our food drive donations. Um, we will be having a socially distanced um, social hour with Starbucks and donuts. Um, and uh, in addition to that, we will also be um, we will also be uh, collecting for a clothing drive. So uh, apologies for that. Um, we are asking that um, we come together as a community and help fill transition projects closets before winter arrives. Um, as we enter the colder months, transition projects need warm coats, socks and gloves. Um, the need for those things increases. During this time of COVID-19 crisis, more people are in need of help. Moreland has been called on to host another clothing drive. So please bring your donations um, of clothing as well as your food donations to the, the church parking lot next Sunday um, at 1130 AM. And I think we're collecting to about one o'clock. Um, again, we're providing Starbucks and donuts and um, we will also be collecting food from our neighbors at that time for the food drive if you would like to join us in that as well. And now we have a special video announcement. Hey, Alice. Hi, Christine, it's so good to see you. Likewise, um, how are you doing? I'm okay. You know, actually, I'm not doing great. I'm stuck in the house so much. All I do is doom scroll and look at all the bad news online. It's so depressing. You know, Alice, I totally know what you mean. I feel so awful about what's happening in our community. I just wish there was something I could do to try to help. Everything's so overwhelming. I just don't know where to start, though. No, I totally understand that. So did I tell you that I recently joined um, a, a Sacred Circle? Oh, I've heard something about that. What is it exactly? Uh, well, Sacred Circle is a group of Moorlanders who are committed to learning more about um, racial and immigrant justice issues. And we're one of uh, 140 congregations participating in a circle that is being um, that is being organized by Emerge, which is Immigrant Interfaith Movement for Immigrant Justice. Wow, that sounds like kind of a big commitment. You know, it really isn't. Um, we meet about two to three hours every month uh, for uh, online for learning and encouragement. Well, that's not too bad. I could do well, that. Yes, and you know, the best part is that um, we take action steps and these action steps are um, simple things like uh, writing our um, leaders, our uh, elected officials and representatives. And most recently, uh, we were collecting donations for uh, immigrants affected by the wildfires. And what I really like about these actions are they have been identified by uh, black led and immigrant uh, organizations. Oh, that's great. That's so important. I could do that. Well, that would be great if you'd like to join us. Um, we need a few more members to round out our circle. Oh, cool. Well, this is giving me some hope and I'm ready to do something instead of just reading about all the bad news and the problems. How can I get connected? Well, that's great, um, Alice. I'm really excited that you're open to joining our circle. And um, I do believe that together we can make a difference. So let me send you some information about how to participate. Awesome. Thank you. All right, what a great opportunity to get involved. Um, now, friends, we are so grateful to be in community with you um, during these times. We are humbled by and grateful for your generosity as part of our community and as part of our larger local community. 
especially in times like these um, during a pandemic and uh, a lot of unexpected things that are going on and occurring with our families and our communities. So we're so grateful for your continued generosity um, and support of the Moreland community. Now in gratitude to God and all the many gifts we have received, let's present our gifts, tithes, and offerings. As we give thanks for those many gifts uh, that we have been blessed with, let's now uh, ask God's blessing for these gifts through praying the prayer that Jesus taught his first disciples to pray, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, who is your name, may your kingdom come, where will we done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day on day bread, and forgive us our debts, as we are there, debtors, and we use them to the teaching, and the earth is evil, the vice, the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of sending is O oh, for a World. Thank you. 
with justice and with praise. Oh, for a world where goods are shared and misery relieved, where truth is spoken, children spare, equality achieved. belong, who perishes will rise. Oh, for a world preparing for God's glorious reign of peace, where time and tears will be no more, and all but love will I invite you to uh, connect together with those with whom you are sheltering. And uh, join together to receive uh, words of benediction. As we do, I want to uh, just highlight a couple of other things. Uh, one is you may have noticed that uh, the, the scene behind me has shifted into uh, autumn. And we have Bill Taylor and his artistry to thank for the beautiful display, both that we had for our Easter season and through the summer, and now for this new fall display. Thanks, Bill, for offering your time and talents uh, to beautify our worship space. And I also wanted to mention that those who may be interested in finding out more about the Sacred Circle, um, Kirsten Pennington and Susan Hoover are the co-leaders of that group. You can contact them. And also Jeannie Witten is our staff uh, contact with that group. Well, you can contact any of those people to find out more information and ways to get connected with our sacred circle. But now friends, hear these words of benediction. In the words of Howard Thurman, do not be silent. There is no limit to the power that may be released through you. So friends, may we be connected and empowered by that love within us, that love that made us, that love that is us. And may we know that power flowing through us into the lives of others and through those others into the lives of still more others. May we encounter that love and be bearers of that love that brings beloved community to one and all and brings a true and lasting peace to our world. And friends, may God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine upon us. May God's grace shine within us. And may God's loving and life-giving presence be within us, with us, among us, and beyond us. This day and every day. And now, our musical benediction. When I am down and oh my soul so weary, 
When troubles come and my heart burden be, then I am strong and wait here in the shadows until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when you are on my shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, sometimes I think I glimpse eternity. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when you are on my shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when you are on my shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when you are on my shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. You raise me up to more than I can be. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. Friends, blessings to you in this week ahead. And uh, special thanks, as always, to Tracy Ross and Devin Miles. And a special thank you to Mike Ray for such beautiful and powerful musical offerings. To Jeannie Witten for her leadership in scripture and in prayer and in community. Uh, to Sarah Gibson, always providing such a gift uh, to our children and to all of us who are children at heart. To Melissa Ferguson, our chief communicator with you all out there on Facebook and beyond. And to all of you, uh, we are so thankful to be connected as community. Look forward to seeing all of you who are able to join us in the parking lot next Sunday. Ian is especially excited to see the friends. Mm -hmm. Are we gonna see the friends next week, Ian? Yes. Yes, we've been wanting to see you friends. We'll be here from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. As Jeannie mentioned, we'll be both collecting food and some of us will be going out into the neighborhood to collect food from our neighbors. But come and join us, not just for coffee and donuts, but for connection. We'll look forward to seeing you then. And until then, love you all and peace be with us all.